Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, let's open to Psalm 33. If you'd like to stand with us, we'll read one verse out of this passage, Psalm 33. We will be turning in several verses today, so I want to encourage you, probably about ten places, so if you've got your Bibles, you'll be using them a little, month, a little bit. By the way, why bring a Bible to church if you're not going to use it? So, just go ahead and say that. So, hopefully you'll get a blessing today. If you don't have your Bible or you can't keep up, just try to listen. And we'll try to, uh, try to get through this material. Psalm 33, we'll read verse number 12, have prayer and get right into the message. Psalm 33, verse number 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Brother Joe Garrison, will you pray and ask the Lord to bless the message, please? Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be here and go out and take on this church. So much to be together tonight, and I can pray for the upcoming message, Lord, that you lay it on your preacher. Give us what you know that we can do. And all these things. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Now, there will be two reactions to this message. One reaction, some of you would just be amen and me all the way, no problem at all. The other reaction may get a little cringe. Somehow you may think I'm not patriotic enough or maybe a little disloyal to our great nation. But I want you to go ahead and be turning to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. My subject title is The God of America. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, and I'm going to give the statement and tell you who the God of America is, and then I'm going to give you the verse to prove it. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. The God of America is the devil. That's pretty good. I got some amens. So I cannot believe a preacher would say that. Well, let's look in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, and let's be Bible believers here. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse number 4, well, back up to verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now turn over to Luke chapter number 4, and you need to keep in mind some things. According to Scripture, the only nation on the face of this earth that has God for its God personally is the nation of Israel. And we know that from Psalm 33, verse number 12, the passage is dealing with the nation of Israel. And so we understand that when you read the Bible, you find out that Israel was under what we call a theocracy. So, preacher, aren't we under a democracy for the people, of the people, by the people? You know, well, the Bible had what that we call a theocracy. God was their king. God was their God. And, of course, they didn't want that. They wanted to overthrow God, and they did. They got rid of Samuel the prophet, and they said, we want a king to rule us like all the other nations. And then you have the whole history of the nation of Israel. And we know that Jesus Christ is born of the seed of David according to the flesh. And one day Jesus Christ is going to come and he's going to take back over that position of being the king over that people and the entire world. However, the Bible is not an American book. The Bible was written by every author in Scripture as a Jewish author. So you have to understand this Bible does come, humanly speaking, from the Jews. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 3 that the oracles of God are from the Jews. So we understand that and we know that Jesus Christ is going to take back over this world one day in the future and he will be the king over the world, but he will be ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. The Bible says in that day there shall be one Lord and his name warned. The Bible says Jerusalem will be called the Lord is there. That will be the name of the city. The Lord is there. 
And so it's interesting when people, especially on a day like today, all across the country, especially conservative type churches, they're waving the red, white, and blue. And don't misunderstand me. I love my country. I am so blessed and thankful that I was born in America. And I'm even wearing my, I've got a blue and red tie on with a little bit of white. So I'm even patriotic here this morning. Amen. My grandfather fought in World War II, and I'm not ashamed of that. And so when you talk this way, some people begin to flip out, but you need to realize, as far as the Bible is concerned, you cannot try to put America under God, you know, under God, one nation under God. That's about the biggest joke I've ever heard. Now, let's look in Luke chapter number 4, and hopefully you'll understand what we're talking about here. Luke chapter number 4, we have the devil tempting Christ. And you know the story. He takes Jesus Christ after 40 days of fasting. And the Bible says in verse number 3, The devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them... For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Do you see that? The devil is the god of this world. And he is over the kingdoms of this world. Yes, he's under God, but he is over the nations of this world. So I'm going to try to preach along these lines the biblical truth that Satan is behind the kingdoms of this world. Because if you don't understand that perspective, you can very easily be ensnared into patriotic perversion. Patriotic perversion. And I don't want you to be ensnared in that. You as a Christian ought to be loyal and you should pledge your allegiance to Jesus Christ first. So we need to see what's behind all this because what happens is you can easily be off track and you can easily see that the battle is a physical battle instead of a spiritual battle. You know, it's amazing how riled up Christians can become about issues that affect their rights and liberties. And I understand that. We can be so bothered by what some crazy people may be doing in the country right now, and we can get all worked up, and your blood begins to boil, and you start getting mad, and then you start talking about it, and that's all you talk about, but you're not even bothered that you have groups like the Mormons or Jehovah's Witness or Roman Catholicism or other groups that are damning souls to hell. You're not riled up about that at all. You're riled up about some idols being pulled down. You're riled up about some images being defaced. You're not riled up about spiritual issues, the fact that people are dying and going to hell, or the fact that false doctrine is permeating the churches. That doesn't bother you. That shows me that it's easy for us to have the tendency, and I put myself included. I'm a red-blooded male American as well. I can get fired up about stupidity just like the next guy. However, when it's all about our physical rights, our physical prosperity, what are they going to do if they take my gun? I wonder if Paul had an AR. I wonder at the great, at, you know, after when we're in eternity, if, if what's really going to matter? Well, I'm going to bleed and die over this. Okay, choose the hill to die on. I'm just going to try to give you a biblical perspective and a Christian perspective. So, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Satan's dominion. I want you to look at two passages in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. So, we're going to look at Satan's beginning. And most of you are familiar with these passages, Ezekiel chapter 28 and Isaiah chapter 14. Where did Satan come from? Somebody said, well, if God's really good, God would not have made the devil. God didn't make the devil. The devil made himself. God created... Satan originally as Lucifer, Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter number 28. Look in Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14 verse number 12 and then Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 12. 
Isaiah chapter number 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? That word Lucifer comes from the word that has to do with light. The Latin lux for light. Notice in Lucifer, the middle letter of the word, of the name, is I. L-U-C-I. And you're going to see this I pop up over and over again. Don't we have these things called I? All, everything's got to be I phones, I this, I. O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Notice Ezekiel chapter number 28, verse number 12. And here we have a very similar case as we read in the New Testament. Remember when Simon Peter grabbed Jesus, when Jesus was talking about the cross, and he shook him and he said, Far be it from thee, Lord. In other words, I don't want you to go to the cross. And remember Jesus looked at him and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Satan was in the man talking. So we have a similar thing here in Ezekiel chapter 28. The king of Tyrus is being addressed, but we know this is beyond just the physical king of Tyrus at that time. You say, how do you know? Look at it. If you back up to verse number 2, Thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God. Notice verse 3. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and thine understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches. All right, verse number 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou wast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Verse 16, By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. We see his beginning as an anointed cherub. He is not just an angel. A cherub is different than an angel. You read about in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10. They had four faces. They had four wings. They had these calves' feet. They were different creatures. They were exalted beings. And he was the anointed cherub. And he covered the throne of God, it seems like, as you read the passage. And he had these jewels and everything in his body, these musical instruments in his body. These instruments were prepared in him. It's almost as if he was the choir director and the musician of heaven. We read over in the book of Job that when the earth was created, the sons of God sang on the creation morning. And that would be the angels. And so we have this beginning of Satan. He's glorious. He's beautiful, he's perfect, but then we have the boasting of Satan. He wanted to take what God had. He rebelled against God, and he wanted God's power and God's throne. And of course, when Satan did that, God says, this ain't happening. Really, if you want to sum up the Bible, you can sum up the Bible like this. You ever play, when you were a kid, you ever play King of the Hill? Yeah. Amen. That was fun. You find some place where they're doing construction or whatever, and they got this thing. You get on the top, and somebody comes. You got to. You can't let them get you. You know. You got to throw dirt in their eyes and everything else. You got to play. You got to be on top of the the thing. When you study the Bible, really, that's kind of simple. Who's the king of the hill? And the devil says, "I want to be number one." God says, "No, I'm number one." And of course, he cast him out. And when you read about the embodiment of Satan now. He said to be this horrendous looking dragon with seven heads and ten horns. He doesn't have this body as a cherub. So he's booted out of heaven. 
He's cast out as profane, the Bible says, out of the mountain of God. You say, well, the, he's talking about the Garden of Eden. This isn't called the Garden of Eden. It's, or the Bible says in Genesis chapter number 2, there was a garden put eastward in Eden. This is said the Garden of God. So there's difference. There's no mountain mentioned in the book of Genesis where Adam and Eve are. This has to do with the earth before Adam ever even shows up. Satan had this connection to the earth. He had this connection under the power of God well before Adam was ever made. That's why there's such a rage that the devil has for this world now. He's booted out and where is his base? Well, in Genesis chapter number 3, I won't turn there, but you know the story. The Bible says the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. So he inhabits this body of this serpent. And the Bible even calls him the old serpent, the devil, in Revelation chapter 12. But he, the Bible says, appears as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So I believe he appears to Eve, not as just vicious looking serpent, but he appears as an angel of light, as a young man. Every angel in the Bible appears as a young man. There's nothing to think any otherwise. And so he appears like that and he begins to talk to her. And we know that he is on the earth as a degenerated being, as a being that's been kicked out of heaven. People say, well, sin's problem is all about Adam and Eve, and if that woman wouldn't have got us in trouble, we'd all be okay. Don't be blaming the woman. You need to be blaming the man. But don't just blame the man. It goes back to the devil. Sin came into the universe by way of Satan. And if you don't understand that, your whole perception of things will be off because you'll think everything's about the flesh. You won't realize there's a cosmic battle that's been going on even before man was made. And we have these angels that kept not their first estate. They were cast out. And we know from Genesis chapter 3 verse number 5, and if I'm giving you too much, just put some of it in your cheek and eat on it later. In Genesis chapter 3 verse number 5, the devil told Eve, he says, God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, you'll be as gods. So who's he talking about? Well, there's fallen angels on the earth. There's something that's taken place before man's ever made. When the Bible says that God created Adam, he made him in his own image, which is obviously different than an angel. An angel doesn't have body, soul, and spirit. An angel's a ministering spirit. And they may can assume flesh, but they don't have a soul. That's why when Christ goes down, the Bible says he preached to the spirits. There are no spirits of man in hell. There's only souls of men in hell. So he's talking about those angels. Anyway... When he created man, the Bible says he created him in his own image. And he said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And so what you have is this spiritual battle that's been taking place before man ever shows up. And so there's this war between God and the devil, or I should say between the devil and God because he started it. And sin came into the universe by way of Satan. And so you need to understand that. Now turn over to Hebrews chapter number 2 and I hope you understand some things about what we're dealing with in life as it relates to the spirit world because if you only see the flesh, you can have a tendency to push back in the flesh. If you only see the flesh, you'll have a tendency to fight the flesh. And oftentimes I think we mistake something that is spiritual in nature and something that is satanic in nature with the flesh. And you need to understand that Sin comes into the universe by way of the devil. The devil has power and authority given to him. I don't want to underestimate the power of the devil, but I am not going to underestimate the power of God either. Amen. I hope you understand God is omnipotent. That means he's all-powerful. God is so powerful, it, it takes as much energy for God to take this handkerchief and move it as it does for him to take the devil and throw him into the, the pit for eternity. It takes no energy or effort whatsoever for God. He's all-powerful. And so the devil has no power against God at all except what God allows the devil to have. So when we discuss these things here, I hope you understand I'm not saying, okay, God doesn't have any power. I believe in the power of God. I believe in the quote-unquote sovereignty of God, if you will. I believe God is all-powerful. He has given the devil a leash. And there's nothing the devil can do without God Knowing and God giving the devil permission to.
to do it. So don't walk around looking for the devil under every rock. Some of you are going to leave here and say, preacher talking about this thing's a, a spiritual battle, so where's the devil? Where's the devil? My car won't crank. It's the devil. I did find a parking spot. And that's the devil. <laughs> I'm trying to help you understand when you read Job, you see the backdrop. So you see that there is this thing between the devil and God going on, but God is allowing the devil to do these things. As a believer in Jesus Christ, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You don't have to be afeard like the old time southerners used to say. Are you afeard? You don't have to be afeard of the devil. You need to be afraid of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. All right, look in Hebrews chapter number 2. Look in verse number 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise himself, speaking of Christ, took part of the same. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. When we think about death in the universe, it's obvious that our whole creation operates along the principle of the cycle of life. I mean, it's pretty hard to imagine in the Garden of Eden, a, a lion and a tiger don't have, you know, teeth to be able to eat other prey. I don't believe that at all. I believe they did. And so when Adam and Eve are given that warning by God in Genesis chapter number 2, they said, of all the trees of the garden thou mayest, God said, of all the trees of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the, that's in the midst of the garden thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So, well, preacher... It didn't happen. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 5, verse number 5, Adam lived to be 930 years old. He didn't die physically the day that he ate of the forbidden fruit. As a matter of fact, God was not referring to physical death at all in Genesis chapter number 2. He doesn't mention physical death until after Adam and Eve sin when he makes the statement, Dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And that's 930 years later. Why was the tree of life for them to eat of in the garden if they didn't have to eat of it? The whole issue is not physical death. The whole issue is that Satan got Adam and Eve to fall under his dominion so they spiritually would not have fellowship with God anymore. You say, what happened when Adam sinned? Adam did die. Part of Adam died. And the part of Adam that died was his spirit. God is a spirit. Adam could not fellowship with God anymore. Instead of fellowshipping with God and running to God, he ran away from God when he sinned. So the power and authority of the devil is over death. And of course, thank God, Jesus Christ died to abolish this power and dominion that death holds on us. For a Christian, death holds no power. Look, I'm, I, I don't want anybody to get sick. I don't want anybody to die. I don't want you to die of old age. You're 120 years old. I want you to make it to 121. Yeah. I mean, that's just how we are. I like breathing. I like life. But the fact is, for a believer in Jesus Christ, death just opens the door to heaven. Death has no power over us as Christians. And Jesus Christ conquered death, hell, and the grave. Here's another thing to consider from the book of Job. You don't have to turn there, but you know the passages. Remember when he tells the devil, God tells the devil, you can do these things to Job. Different things happen. One of them's a whirlwind. It has to do with the, with the atmosphere on the earth. Uh, another thing has to do with, with uh, these armies coming in and fighting. That was under the devil's control. Another thing had to do with sickness. This disease that Job had under the devil's dominion. There's a lot of things that are under satanic dominion that we might not be aware of, but here's where I really want to preach a little bit in our patriotic sermon, <laughs> is the idea of kingdoms, kings, princes, and principalities. Take your Bible and go to Ephesians chapter number 2. Look in Ephesians 2, and then we'll look in Ephesians 6. When you read the book of Daniel, you find a peeling back of the spiritual world as well. Because in the book of Daniel, Daniel is obviously a Jew in captivity under the Gentile kingdoms. 
And God begins to give Daniel some insight on what's going to take place. And as Gabriel begins to tell him what's happening, he makes statements that at first seem to be kind of strange, but then he explains them a little bit. And as we go through the Bible and understand how the devil works with the kingdoms of men, we find out what these statements mean. For instance, he says, the angel says, that he was fighting with the prince of the kingdom of Persia. The angel was fighting with the prince. He says in Daniel chapter 10, he says, well, I will return to fight with the prince of Persia when I'm gone forth. Lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. So we have this prince, this angel rather, that represents Israel saying, look, I've been fighting over here with the, the prince of Persia, and then I'm going to go fight with Greece. If you know anything about history, that's how the kingdoms go. It goes from the Babylonians to the Persians to the Grecian kingdoms. Alexander the Great. So what insight we get is that the kingdoms on earth have representation in the spiritual realm. And so this idea of Satan being a king or Satan being a prince is true. You read the Gospels before Jesus Christ mentions the devil as a prince. John chapter 12, John chapter 14, John chapter 16. He says, the prince of this world cometh and he hath nothing in me. And he's making reference actually to Judas, the son of perdition. Judas Iscariot, the one that would betray him, and we know that the devil filled Judas Iscariot. He says, the prince of this world, making reference to the devil. Look in Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 1. And you hath he quickened, that's to make alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. There's a prince that rules in the heavenly places, in the sphere of the air. You know, when the Bible makes reference to the spirit, it uses a synonym for air or wind. We know in Ezekiel, whenever Ezekiel has that vision of the valley of dry bones, and he sees all these bones, and the Lord says, Ezekiel, can these bones live? He says, thou knowest. And then God begins to breathe. There's a wind that comes. And that wind puts life in the bones. So spirit is typified as life. When God created Adam, the Bible says he created man of the dust of the ground. There's his body. And breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. There's his spirit. And then man became a living soul. So spirit is synonymous with life. When Jesus said in John chapter 3, a man must be born again, he illustrates it by wind. He says, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. A spiritual birth is not something you can see physically, but it's something that can be felt like wind and like air can be felt. When the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, there was a sound like a rushing mighty what? Wind that came in. And so here we see that the devil's a prince of the power of the air. The spiritual, there's all kind of things in the airways, right? Years ago they discovered wavelengths and all those kind of things and man's begun to be able to beam signals and send stuff through the air. There's stuff flying through your head and through my body and your body right now as we speak. And if you have the right transmitter you can pick it up and it talks. There's images flying through the air right now as we talk. Images are flying right through. You just can't pick them up. They're in the air. Now turn over to chapter number 6. You know, you'll notice in Ephesians 2 he mentioned the course of this world. This world is moving in a way. There's an electricity to it. There's a, a, a static to it. There's a, a movement to this world. And one thing we've lost, especially as American Christians. And I say that because I is one. I'm proud to be an American. I'm glad I'm an American. Don't go out of here and misunderstand this message. But there's something that we have, we've lost. We've lost the friction that should come with Christians and the world. You should be so much opposite of the world that they think you are weird. You should be going in so much opposition to the world that they stink in your nostrils and you stink in their nostrils. 
But that's not the case. When you study church history, you see, especially after the fundamentalist movement of the 20s and 30s, the church says, we can't beat this thing. Basically, on the whole, this is a very simple summary. We can't beat it, so we need to get along with everybody so we can reach as many people as we can. And that, if that means we have to compromise our doctrine, that means we have to compromise our standards and things, whatever we got to do to reach the masses. And here we are. You have people that have no absolute truth at all. Your opinion is just as good as mine. They've given up their absolute truth. Ephesians chapter number 6. So notice here, the principalities and powers, verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put all the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against, here's that word, prince, principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we have to understand there are kings and kingdoms that are underneath the control of the devil. 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. One thing that's interesting about this uh, weird time that we're in now is this is not anything that's isolated to any one particular culture, ethnic group, or country. And when you read the Bible, you understand that the end times, there is going to be a global religion and there's going to be a global connection and a global economy. There is in Bible Scripture no indication that there is a superpower over here in the West. I don't see it. So what does that mean? That means this great and mighty red, white, and blue does not figure in on the end times prophecies that you read about in Daniel and the book of Revelation. So what happens to us? I don't know. Become third rate power, I guess. So when does that happen? I don't know. I'm not a prophet. I want to give you this uh, quote from C.I. Schofield. It's classic. This is a classic definition of the world system. And the Greek word for that is cosmos. You know the word. You've heard it. In the sense of the present world system, the ethically bad sense of the word refers to the order arrangement under which Satan has organized the world of unbelieving mankind upon his cosmic principles of force, greed, selfishness, ambition, and pleasure. This world system is imposing and powerful with armies and fleets, is often outwardly religious, scientific, cultured and elegant, but seething with national and commercial rivalries and ambitions, is upheld in any real crisis by armed force, and is dominated by satanic, satanic principles. The Schofield Reference Bible in the book of Revelation. Now what are his devices? If we were to understand, Paul says, look, you, don't, you need to put on the whole armor of God so you're not tricked. The wiles of the devil, somebody to be wild, to have wiles is to, to be very tricky. The Bible says he was more subtle than any beast of the field. Here's what you understand. The devil will always disguise himself. And I believe he will do that even in our day. We have to look back. I'm not here to preach against people who aren't here. I'm trying to preach to us. We need some help. We need some perception, some biblical counsel. What has he done to us? Well, I believe that he's always going to disguise himself, so I need to try to look not in the obvious place. Well, Satan's down there at the beer hall. Well, no, he might be in the church. He might be in the pulpits. He might be in conservative movements. <gasps> He's always disguised. And no marvel, the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. He's disguised and he's deceptive. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out. He is deceptive. You know there's another thing that's deceptive, and here's where, you know how they have, you ever have those magnets? I love magnets. And if I hadn't been to FSU, that magnet place, that's a scary place. People get killed over there, man. Uh, I've heard about it, the largest magnet in North America, I think. But anyway, you ever get those magnets, you start pushing them together and flipping them around? That stuff's neat. 
and you, you flip the thing around, then they'll attract and just, they'll go together. Satan is deceptive, and there's something else that's very deceptive that's attracted to that. The Bible says in Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So there's a part in us that can be pulled into his deception. You say, well, preacher, I'm just following my heart. This is what I believe. The Bible says, he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. You're not supposed to make decisions and judgments based on feelings. You're supposed to make decisions and judgments based on facts. And for those of you in the other room, I'm holding up my Bible. Facts. And so we need to get a biblical perception because what happens is the devil wants to disguise himself and he wants to deceive us. How does he do it in the book of Genesis? Well, when he comes to Eve, he first off starts off doubting what God says. He says, yea, hath God said? Question mark. Very positive, very congenial, very nice. I mean, she was probably over there kind of walking close to the tree anyway, or she'd been looking at it for a while. But he, he began with doubt. Are you really sure God wrote and said what he said he said. Are you really sure you can trust what God said? Doubt what God said. And then he moves into denying what God said. You know what he comes out to say? He says, whenever she says, God has said, we can't even touch it. And we might die if we touch it. Then he quotes God correctly. She misquotes God. Then he says, ye shall not surely die. He starts off doubting what God says. And then you talk long enough. Talk, 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 talk you'll wind up denying what God said. And then he demoralizes what God said because then he says, he gives his commentary on it. Here's the reason why. You know, it's a conspiracy. You know, here's, here's the thing. God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, you'll be as God's knowing good. And you see, God is not only telling you not to eat this, but he's telling you not to eat this not for your own good, but for his own good. He's holding something back from you. He's making God out to be bad instead of good. And when you start getting along that line of thought to where you start thinking God does not love you or God's doing something to harm or hurt you or God could have did this or God didn't do that, you are falling in Satan's trap. So while I'm very intellectual, I've really been thinking this out, I've read all these books, you are falling into Satan's trap because he deals primarily in the sphere of knowledge. What's the tree called? The knowledge of good and evil. We have more knowledge now. We have the dumbest people you ever saw on the face of the planet. <laughs> I don't even have to give illustrations. Your mind is already thinking of a bazillion illustrations. So I will not belabor the point. Stupid! They can't think. F-T-H-I-M-K. Think, think, think. He demoralizes what God said. What does this lead to? It leads to him deluding them and to him dominating them. He turned a look into lust. He turned curiosity into covetousness, a desire into a decision, a choice into a chain, a sinner, Eve, into a seducer. That's what happens in Genesis chapter 3. And really it's the fundamental problem. You say, what's the problem? Look at little babies. What do they start doing? They start putting everything in their mouth. They start off butt naked and putting everything in their mouth. Just like Adam and Eve in the garden. Right? That's Genesis chapter 3. And then he distorts. And here's where I want to kind of go with our patriotism deal. He'll turn freedom into folly, liberty into license, and affluence into approval. He emphasizes the physical over the spiritual. He always twists everything. He always gets the focus out. And he gets us to think wrong and passionate about the wrong thing. And so his goal is to get you grounded. In Ephesians chapter number 1, I was mentioning heavenly places and talking about the air. It's interesting because Ephesians starts off with the theme that we're in Christ and we're seated in Christ where? In heavenly places. So we're to be heavenly minded. You say, preacher, you're so heavenly minded, you know earthly good. Well, I don't think you can be earthly good unless you're heavenly minded. However, the devil wants to ground us. 
You see, the Lord wants us to be connected to Him. And He said in John chapter 6, His words were spirit. And so if we're to be spiritually minded instead of earthly minded, if we're to set our affections on things above, not on things on the earth, then that means we need to be plugged in up there instead of plugged in down here. Some of you are too plugged in down here. You got to find out what's going on in the news. You got to plug in and find out what the latest counts are. You got to find out and plug in and everything's about what's going on down here. I'm not telling you to be uninformed and walk around, you know, and you're thinking, where's everybody at? Well, they've been evacuated because there's a, you know, a, 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 a hurricane levels off the charts coming from Jefferson County. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, too late now. <laughs> but what I'm saying is you can be too plugged in down here and not plugged in up there. And Satan wants to ground you. You should be in heavenly places. And he's used our freedoms and liberties against us, I believe. So how do you, how do you think that? Well, our comfort is more important than our convictions. I know with this craziness that's going on, I think they're going to be sending people in some of the California churches to see if they're singing so they can arrest them. That's the word. I don't know if they're really going to do it or not, but because it's against the law to sing in church out there. And they have their reasons. But when it gets beyond some type of physical thing that a scientist might be able to prove and it becomes an idea that your preacher is going to preach on that morning, and there may be some people in the church that accuse him of a hate crime because he actually says those words, are you going to be here? If you knew it was a possibility you'd be arrested this morning, would you have come? I'm not saying it trying to be mean to you because I, I don't really know where I'm at on all of this sometimes. I'm thinking, man, do I really like my comforts? How much do I like my comforts? Now, I know when it's all about our freedoms, we want to shout down the house, but when it comes to the Bible and it comes to your convictions and the gospel of Jesus Christ... I think the devil's got us where money's more important than morals. Supposed Christians on county commissioners, all county commission seats all across this great nation have voted in alcohol, even though the Bible preaches against it. Good members of churches have voted on that kind of stuff and have brought it back in and promoted it because it'll bring in some much needed revenue. Money more important than morals. Who's on the right is more important than what's right. I don't know if you know this. There's a lot of Republicans going to be in hell. Oh, yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. There's a lot of conservatives roasting because they rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior. And there's a lot of religious people that don't believe in salvation by grace through faith that have morals. Everybody's got morals to some extent. Might be the morals of an alley cat, but they're morals nonetheless. <laughs> Judges in Washington are more important than the judge in heaven. Israel today is more important than the Israel in the millennium. And I could go on and on, but I won't. Now finally, I want to give you this and we'll wrap it up. Satan will be destroyed. And thank God for that. The God of America will be destroyed. The God of this world, Satan, will be destroyed. We know he's already been defeated at the cross. The Bible says Christ spoiled the principalities and powers. He made a show of them. He showed out. He's dethroned at the second advent. We know the Antichrist will rise up. He's called the man of sin, the son of perdition. We understand that. He will be on the throne and he will be worshipped by the entire world. We understand those things. But when Jesus Christ returns, Revelation 19, verse number 20, he takes the beast and the false prophet and he casts them into the lake of fire. We know that the devil, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 20, will be detained during the millennial kingdom. Revelation chapter number 20, there's an angel that takes Satan and binds him with a great chain and bounds him in the bottomless pit for a thousand year period. And we know that after that thousand year period, he's loosed, 
He goes out to deceive the four quarters of the earth. They come against Jerusalem where Christ is. The Bible says fire came down from heaven out of God and destroyed them. And we know the Bible says in Revelation 20 verse number 10, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire where the beast and false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. He is going to be destroyed. Here's what I want you to get. The devil will not be defeated by Christians overthrowing Roe versus Wade. The devil will not be defeated by putting conservative judges on the bench. The devil will not be defeated by the red, white, and blue standing against LGBTQRSTVWXYZ because they're not. The rainbow's never going to disappear. And I'm talking about Noah's rainbow, of course. I always liked rainbows. <laughs> the devil's always got to mess everything up, right? The devil is not going to be destroyed, take a big inhale, by militia groups protecting idols and images. We have an identity problem. This is where it boils down to. We choose to identify ourselves with our heritage. And I'm not trying to belittle the dead, but your grandfather and grandmother and great-grandmother and grandfather were sinners, and their lineage goes back to Adam, and they were depraved, and they made bad choices, and I know we only want to remember the good, and that's a blessing, and I know that people always judge people by their worst moment. I get all that, but what I'm saying is we've lost our identity as Bible-believing Christians. We are identified with these saints of old that said, you know what? We're more concerned with people getting saved than people getting reelected. You got Christians that will spend more time campaigning than they will trying to win people to Christ. Something's gone here. I read a little bit about history, and I read about the old evangelicals. I'm talking about Whitfield and Wesley and, and Jonathan Edwards and those crowds back in and the Bible, and not the Bible, but history records that they had little interest with social ills of the day. It was whenever they began to water down things that they got involved in politics and they got involved in social issues and trying to help people physically. They used to be concerned about men's souls. It's an after effect. It's pollution. It is corruption. It is compromise where it turns into a modernistic type of social Christianity. We are not here to feed the world. We're not here to liberate groups. We're here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ for personal, individual conversion. And that's why it was so successful in America. Way more successful than in Britain and in France and other places. And Wales had some revivals, but in America you had that individualism. And that's why we focus on your individual, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And once you start getting beyond that, you know what you start doing? Well, I know they don't believe in Jesus, but we're all voting for the same person, so we're going to go to their house and we're going to have a party together. Yeah, you're going to be compromising your Christian convictions for some political expediency, or you're going to compromise your Christian conviction because of your heritage and your community and your social impact. You have an identity problem. You need to identify as a Christian first, an American second. You would say, I'm an American Christian. No, you need to say, I'm a Christian American. Have the correct balance. We have a responsibility to pray for our officials. I believe we ought to be the best citizens there are. We should. But we ought to be the best Christians that we are. I'll read you this and I'm done. This was a, uh, the following words were written on the tomb of an Anglican bishop in Westminster Abbey years and years ago. When I was young and free, my imagination had no limits. I dreamed of changing the world. As I grew older and wiser, I discovered the world would not change. So I shortened my sight somewhat and decided to change only my country. But it too seemed immovable. As I grew into my twilight years, in one last desperate attempt, I settled for changing only family, those closest to me. But alas, they would have none of it. And now as I lay on my deathbed, I suddenly realized if I only had changed myself first, then by example, I would have changed my family. From their inspiration and encouragement, I would then have been able to better my country. And who knows, I may have even changed the world. 
we need to get our head out of all this global country, nationalistic, and we need to be us and Jesus first. You husbands and you fathers, you need to be praying with your families. Build yourselves up on your most holy faith. And as a church, we can have revival. We can do right. This world's going to hell. We can still know that we're going to heaven. So you know who the God of America is? Amen. Amen. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for the word. Lord, help us to have right perspective. Lord, I know that we can take these truths and sometimes we can pull them either to one side or the other. Help us to have the right balance. Lord, it's easy to be tied in with emotion, especially when it affects the way we live from day to day. God, I'm just like anybody else. I like my routine. I like how things are. But Lord, I pray you'd help us as Christians to realize we're ambassadors from another country. Lord, one day you're going to remove these ambassadors and the amnesty is going to be over and you're going to declare war on this world. And Lord, help us to see it as that. Help us to have the right perspective on this world. This world truly is not our home. We're just passing through. I'm afraid that so many of us, maybe even through the blessings that we've gotten, we've just gotten so used to what we have. We've taken it for granted often, Lord, and we've also let that twist our minds. Father, I pray that we would realize that we need to be focused on heaven. We need to be focused on eternal things and do what we're supposed to do for Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to keep the focus right. I pray, God, that you may be with our elected officials and our government. We do pray. Like the Bible tells us to pray for them, not for their personal well-being necessarily, but so we can live a quiet and peaceable life. We do like freedom. We appreciate it. And Lord, we know that the greatest gift of freedom is the ability to be able to preach and worship just like we are doing this morning. And we don't want to lose it. But Lord, if we do, we know that we still have truth in Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that you might help us and encourage us. We thank you for your grace. Thank you for those that have come out. Pray, Lord, a special blessing on them today. Be with our church family. We think of those that are sick, those that are going through difficulties and valleys. Lord, just help them, please. And we just ask that your grace would be all sufficient. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. <clears throat>